I'm going to describe the history of aerodynamics uh, from 1974 to 2024 and the future. Uh, I want to thank the members of the uh, VFS Aerodynamics Committee who contributed to this. Uh, the context is, of course, the uh, six decennial uh, roadcraft dynamics and aeromechanics meetings that we've been holding. Uh, so starting in 1974 uh, to today, and just for symmetry, we'll look 50 years in the future. Um, there are lots of, aerodynamics covers a huge range of topics. I'm going to focus on just these four uh, today. Uh, they provide uh, some interesting milestones, uh, you know, so I didn't have to go too much beyond this. And the first one is computational fluid dynamics. Um, that's what, CFD is what advanced numerical aerodynamics means today. And uh, it's solving the three-dimensional, unsteady, vertical, compressible, viscous, turbulent flow. And when you add rotational wings, that makes everything harder. And our, our goal is to accurately predict performance, air loads, noise, of any rotors that people can design. Um, in the framework, uh, again, of our uh, decennial meetings, go from almost no papers to uh, over 200, 250 papers a year now. Before 1970, what you had for aerodynamics panel methods, acceleration potential, of course, you know, blade element theory, that's not what CFD means today. Um, and to put uh, you know, sort of a parallel timeline to CFD, I'll also mention some of the uh, big computers. Uh, 1972, ILIAC-4 showed up at NASA Ames. Uh, wasn't online, actually, until 1975. And, and just like with the mainframes being applied to rotor dynamics and handling qualities problems, uh, rotorcraft applications were among the first for these high performance computing. And again, for context, the, the fixed wing world was making great advances in CFD. Uh, I mentioned only Merman and Cole, you know, a crucial uh, paper about how to do transonic, uh, you know, uh, flow solution. Um, and in 1972, Caradonna gave us the first application of CFD to a rotating wing, but it was hover, it was non-lifting. I'm not going to call that a, a, ro a rotor solution. So we get to 1974, there is no CFD for rotorcraft. It's 1982 when I'll call the first, finally, the first CFD solution for a rotor blade. Three-dimensional, unsteady, lifting flow on a rotor. Uh, this is, you know, work by Caradonna and Tune Desopair. Um, still, however, you know, transonic small disturbance potential, and not all the flow fields. Uh, so, so, so the wake and blade motion, well, especially the influence of the wake, had to come from an effective angle of attack. Now, moving on into the 80s, uh, you know, people moved from small potential to full potential to Euler equations. Uh, late 80s, you know, start to see solutions in Avia Stokes. Uh, get to 1984 decennial, and we get maybe 20 papers a year. Uh, 1984 was a key milestone in that uh, we developed uh, CFD CSD loose coupling. For rotorcraft, loose coupling means exchange the information for an entire revolution of periodic loads and motion, you know. Uh, tight coupling means exchanging information at every time step. Um, now, you want a comprehensive analysis to handle trim and blade motion. Uh, at this time, it was still, the CFD was still transonic small disturbance, and so it wasn't doing all the blade. It wasn't doing the retreating side. It wasn't doing the wake. So the comprehensive analysis at this time still had to do uh, a lot of the, you know, the aerodynamics, but Okay, this was the start, again, of loose coupling development. 
1984 is also when we saw the Cray computer at, at Ames. Uh, 90s, you will start to see the first appearance of the major computer codes for CFD that uh, uh, the names of which are you know, still active. Uh, 1991, TURNS, which is a U.S. Army code, Overflow, which is NASA. Uh, that gets us to 1994 conference. Uh, FLOWER, which is German, ELSA, French, Fluent, Commercial Code. There we are in 2004. Uh, 2004, loose coupling finally came into its own, you know, confirmed as a sound efficient method. What we needed was uh, solutions of Navier Stokes, solutions of the entire flow field, and also you had to get the pitching moment right. Okay, so, so you know, it, 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 it took some time between first developing the coupling method and, and, and being able to call it uh, you know, something we can routinely use. And it was demonstrated this time in the con you know, using the uh, data from the UAS-60 airloads uh, program. The figure at the upper right, that's the, uh, just you know, illustrates the uh, you know, steady state flight conditions of, of, of the uh, airloads program. Uh, 2004, TAU, which is a, another German code, uh, uh, HMB, UK uh, analysis. Um, and then we had actually uh, tight coupling uh, applied to one of the uh, uh, maneuver cases of the uh, uh, UH-60 airloads program. 2008, Pleiades at, at Ames, and this is at, at Ames at least the start of the, you know, the, the multiprocessor uh, supercomputers where you had tens, you know, you know thousands or tens of thousands of, of, of cores available. Uh, 2008, Helios, the uh, U.S. Army code, uh, RFlow 3D from uh, Japan, Star CCM Plus, uh, another commercial code. 2024, again, we get to the point now where CFD is a, a pretty routine uh, tool for aerodynamics. So, again, my, my count is 250 papers a year uh, on CFD for rotorcraft. So where do we stand? CFD, widespread use for rotorcraft design, development, and assessment. I, I do believe that some more work will be needed. Uh, you, can, you can read the black lines. I'll just uh, mention the, uh, the highlighted uh, points. Um, one thing we haven't touched yet is, uh, I, I believe we do need to have methodologies for extracting linearized systems from the high fidelity uh, aerodynamic analysis. Uh, linearized systems needed for stability evaluation, needed for control design. Without them, CFD isn't going to be your only toolkit. Okay, with, with, without the linearized uh, extraction method, you're still going to need the comprehensive analyses. Um, there's still things in turbulence, transition modeling, separation, dynamic stall, even weight capture that I think work is needed. Now, I put the question mark there because I don't know what is needed, but something is needed. Um, and the last one is to, just to remind uh, what our objective here with aerodynamic calculations. Um, we, we, we want to be able to support aircraft development, and that means robust, reliable prediction of rotorcraft performance, and this is anything anybody can sketch out. And our goal that's been identified for the last 40 years is 1% accuracy, and we are not there yet. Again, that's, I don't know what it's going to take to get there. That's my, my, my question marks are there. Uh, next subject, dynamic stall, which is, you know, uh, a subset uh, in terms of uh, high fidelity, a subset of the CFD, uh, just illustrating the uh, papers per year CFD for dynamic stall. Uh, of course, stall, very complicated for rotors. Uh, it's unsteady, it's compressible, three dimensional. I'll just remind you, you, know, you get a rapid increase in angle attack, delays stall, and then when stall occurs, it's very more severe than static stall. Um, and you get a leading edge vortex that is responsible for high blade and control loads in forward flight. Um, 
a still a major approach for uh, 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 dynamic cell modeling is, is is development of empirical models, and they go back to the, you know the, you know the late 60s, 1970s. The uh, now a lot of the uh, these empirical models have come and gone. You know they they you know you know they don't really uh, get adopted by the community. Uh, the Boeing method is still around uh, in use, and because it's just so simple. 1974, we did have, you know, the, the conference did have a paper on uh, dynamic stall modeling and, uh, you know, correlation of flight tests. Or, you know, 1970s, you, people did start to apply Navier-Stokes to uh, dynamic stall. It tended to be um, uh, uh, low Reynolds number, though, just, just, you know, because of the computational challenges. Uh, Late 70s, early 80s, you have uh, one of the milestones is a major series of, of tests uh, at the U.S. Army Laboratory. This is you know, by McCroskey, Carr, McAllister. Uh, the figure on, on, on the right there is, is, is from their work. Um, you know, again, a series of tests that then, you know, the data besides supplying, uh, 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 you know, uh, information that people can correlate with, uh, the data help to explain the phenomenon of dynamic stall. And I think, I think that's the, you know, the the big contribution of that that work. Uh, Owner Edlin uh, empirical dynamic stall in 1980. Again, something that's uh, still still in use today, largely because it's thoroughly documented. Uh, 1984, another paper on dynamic stall modeling. Uh, uh, 86, Leishman Beddows. Uh, uh, very, very, very useful because you know, not too many uh, empirical parameters, and, and you get some of them from the uh, 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 from from the static airflow tables. It's it's the late '80s, early '90s when Navier-Stokes applications to rotors, you know, dynamic cell and rotors, really came into play. Um, a related aspect is the uh, subject of stall delay, which is very important for propellers, for uh, prop rotors. Uh, rotors with high twist, low aspect ratio, very important for wind turbines. Uh, I've identified uh, Snell's work. There's, there's a lot of modeling of uh, uh, stall delay and wind turbines. In, 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 in the rowcraft world, Corrigan and, and Selig are, are, the, are the tools we usually use. Um, 2004, dynamic stall, uh, one of the uh, major issues that was explored with the uh, UH-60 airloads flight test program. Uh, the figure on the on the bottom there is uh, Bill Bowsman's interpretation of the, uh, you know, both the calculations and dynamic stall in the context of both the calculations and in the test data. Um, in uh, 2020, there was a, a a report of a of a decade long exercise to uh, uh, essentially establish our capability to calculate. Dynamic stall, as at least, especially as a two-dimensional phenomenon, but also on rotor blades. Um, the and and the and the figures are you know some of the correlation from 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 that paper. Uh, the uh, conclusion was that we really do have the capabilities for two D dynamic stall to 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 you know predict it, and that brings us up to today. So where we are today, okay. Uh, we are able to calculate uh, dynamic stall, rotor airfoils, and and on rotors. I think there's probably you know it's it's stall is still a very hard thing to for CFD to deal with. I think I think there's probably still you know things to be learned there. Uh, also, I think we will have a continuing need for these empirical models and. Uh, for, for use in comprehensive analysis. And what's missing there is a way to identify the parameters. Uh, all these, you know, like I said, there's, there's dozens of empirical models out there, three or four of them that uh, remain popular. They all need many, many empirical parameters and we don't know how to get them. So that's, that's, that's what's needed in the future. My third topic is finite state wake models. Um, Rotor wakes important for almost everything that happens on helicopters, and uh, for stability analysis, for uh, real-time stimulations, what we need is a finite state model of the wake. Uh, and what we call dynamic inflow is a three-state model where um, 
uniform and gradient inflow variables are responding to aerodynamic thrust and hub moments on the rotors. Uh, basically, you know, typically based on uh, vortex theory for actuator discs. Uh, the theory goes back to work in the 30s, Kinder, uh, 1948, Mangler, uh, uh, where, you know, you know, solving, you know, for actuator disc, uh, you know, vortex theory, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then there's, uh, you know, a, a initial experimental work in, uh, by you know, Carpenter and Friedrich, uh, and that established, uh, you, know, um, you know, besides experimental uh, work on, uh, on, on dynamic response of, of, of rotors to collective changes, also established a simple uh, uh, model based on momentum theory. Oh, and Emza Cruz uh, uh, also did some experimental work with, with cyclic uh, input. Um, at the 1974 conference, uh, Dave Peters, who is in the audience today, uh, had, a, had a very fundamental paper uh, using some uh, hingeless rotor uh, data to uh, uh, establish both the uh, capabilities and the shortcomings of the, you know, the ability to predict that. Um, and then uh, some years later, then, uh, 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 Dave, working with Dale Pitt, uh, developed dynamic inflow models for uh, wake in unsteady aerodynamics. Again, it's, it's, it's based on uh, elliptical coordinates. That's this, 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 this picture that uh, on the bottom right that uh, uh, shows up in, you know, for many uh, years. Um, in the early 80s, uh, Bill Bowsman uh, did a interesting little test of ground resonance on a model rotor. It was a hinges rotor, so it developed uh, hub moments that could produce uh, you know, inflow changes, and he found an extra state. He, he basically found all of the states in the test, and on the, on the bottom right, there's the frequency versus RPM, and the top two there are pitch and roll, ground resonance test. But he found the, you know, the bottom one, you know, and it, it wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, well, okay. Uh, when we when we tried to predict that with uh, adding uh, uh, you know the, you know, the uh, dynamic inflow models, we were able to identify this as as an inflow mode, and 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 the key importance is that this is evidence, experimental evidence, that the air, the wake, really does behave as a state, as a as a dynamic inflow state. So so it. it it isn't just the correlation, but it's the fact that the idea of, of, of global states for the wake are, are, are realistic. Uh, Peters and Ho extended that uh, to multiple states. Uh, again, still actuator disk with uh, uh, elliptical coordinates. That's the figure on the left. And then we have the, you know, uh, in, uh, the inflow uh, calculations. Um, in the, in the 90s, um, uh, people added the weight curvature to these models, and, and that was motivated by the fact that in flight tests, um, uh, the figure on the right there is, is, is showing the uh, U860 pitch response to a uh, lateral stick, and the initial response pitch due to lateral stick, which is the off-axis, the initial response was in the wrong direction. We couldn't, we couldn't predict the direction. You don't like to get the signs wrong. Okay, and and in the context of the um, of, of, of 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 the wake on the left, you can see that uh, you know rolling of the aircraft, or in this case pitching, uh, changed the wake geometry. And in the context of of, of dynamic inflow, uh, it's curvature. Now dynamic inflow already had the skew of the flow, but by by adding the curvature, they were able to uh, introduce a a a a, a Inflow gradient due to the roll, uh, roll or pitch motion, they got the sign right. So that's very good. Um, people are still working on dynamic inflow, trying to get, especially these days, the uh, uh, flow throughout the uh, flow field. Um, 2008, Dave Peters gave his Nikolsky lecture on the subject of dynamic inflow. And he, he didn't pursue it too much, but he had this little. Uh, uh, you know, 
explanation of his 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 title, the the competition, where where you have dynamic inflow, the you know the little uh, you know mammal running around com trying to compete with the big boys there. No suggestion that the big boys are going to go extinct and leave just dynamic <laughs> inflow, but uh, might might have been what they meant. Okay. Anyway, anyway, still working on that. Now, one of the key things that's happened uh, recently is is a focus on uh, using primer identification, uh, going from higher fidelity aerodynamic analyses to identify the primers associated with a dynamic inflow model. Um, on the left, you have free wake. On the right, you have free wake. In the middle, we have VPM. But using these mid fidelity, higher fidelity uh, models. Uh, to, to then uh, uh, identify pr the parameters that you can then use in uh, the uh, state space uh, uh, world. And that leads us to today. Again, okay, since Mangler, Carpenter, and Friedrich, we've had 70 years, uh, we're working now on still on getting the inflow off the rotor disk, uh, working on interference between rotors. Uh, primer identification is something that uh, is, is, is coming into its own. Um, 50 years from now, well, it, maybe we will have the final definitive finite state weight model. It's maybe not. Uh, I do expect we will have primer identification methods that essentially standard methods for, for uh, whatever the rotorcraft configuration we come up with. We have to be able to handle multi-rotor interference, arbitrary rotor configurations, so I, I think that's how we will do it. The last subject I'm going to do is rotor air loads test. Now, there's lots of aerodynamic testing that goes on. Uh, I'm just going to focus on air loads tests. Uh, Bill Bowsman had a, had a Nikolsky lecture that devoted to this. I, I used a lot of material from that. Quoting Bill, knowledge of the air loads, fundamental to understanding how helicopters work. Before 1974, before our first decennial meeting, one, you know, we did have a CH-34 flight test and wind tunnel test. And this is a very important uh, experiment. It was used in the uh, air loads, you know, uh, developing air loads prediction codes, that's the Miller work. Uh, Ward looked at the data to uh, figure out dynamic stall. Hooper looked at it to uh, sort out uh, negative loading on the advancing side. So tremendous amount of, uh, of, of, of uh, pr uh, work as a direct consequence uh, of this data set. And actually in that time period before 1974, there were actually quite a few uh, flight tests. Most, you know, most of them did, you know, well, all of these did, were, were, were not as a, the consequence of the H-34. Uh, most of them did not have enough cord-wise stations to really give you good data. Most of them were not documented well. In many cases, the data is just plain lost. Okay, so, so it, it, it was something that we were doing a lot of at the time. It's just the H-34... Uh, especially because it was documented, you know, uh, you know, you know, was was a milestone, and that brought us to you know, 1974. We had that data in hand. Oops, whoops. Uh, I mentioned the CFD uh, progress. Well, in 1975, Owner did a you know series of experiments devoted with rigid rotors, uh, uh, specifically devoted to getting. Air loads data to uh, support CFD development. That was very important. Kara Donna and Tung did a, a two-bladed rotor test in uh, 1981, and 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 you know that that was a hover test. They measured air loads. Uh, you know that that's one of the things I consider of, of you know a, a milestone. Every development of a CFD code compares with Kara Donna and Tung at the start to to prove that they you know that that they're working. Uh, got us to 1984. Um, in in the early 90s, up to 2010, U860 air, air loads program. I think that's the next huge milestone in in air loads testing, both the flight test and wind tunnel test. Uh, it's been used to, to develop CFD calculations. It's been tremendous value. 
you know, the, the figure shows the uh, flight test points. Uh, uh, the ones on the right show, you know, uh, you know, the the map of the dynamic stall and 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 also some of the air loads uh, data. Um, high harmonic control, uh, air acoustic rotor test, the heart test, uh, very important, and because that uh, was conducted in the DNW, which is very good uh, anechoic uh, test uh, facility, so it had acoustic data. Uh, so. It, besides pressure data on, on, on the blades, we had acoustic data and uh, also in, involved high harmonic control. Uh, so, so again, very extensive use to develop uh, you know, CFD air acoustic codes. Uh, that was followed in the DNW by the TRAM. So we do have tilt rotor uh, performance uh, air loads uh, data uh, on, a, on, a, on a quarter scale tilt rotor. Uh, 2008, go ahead in Europe, where now it's not just the rotor, but we had tail rotor and fuselage as well, again in the DNW. Uh, and most recently, you know, just last year, finished the uh, hover validation and acoustic baseline, the HVAB test, uh, hover test in the AB120 with performance, air loads, blade motion, uh, boundary layer transition, wake geometry, uh, uh, huge suite of uh, uh, of uh, 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 of, of data that will be useful, you know, for uh, uh, advancing the hover air loads prediction capability in the next uh, decade. And so that's the, that brings us to today's conference. Uh, so what do we have now? What do I expect to see in the future? Well, I do expect that we will continue to get more and more detailed measurements. So not just pressures, but boundary layer, wakes, acoustics. There are more configurations that could use this data in order to substantiate our tools. Uh, tilt rotors, we, you know, we don't have small scale, we don't have conversion, we don't have high speed axial. Uh, tilt rotors are unique because of the high twist, low aspect ratio blades. The UAM world is, is, is lacking propeller-like things, so very stiff rotors, hingeless rotors. Uh, but they're flying them in edgewise flight, going up to fairly high advance ratios because of the low tip speeds, large, him, large lift offsets. So again, unique uh, geometries and environment that, that will need data. And then planetary rotors, especially on Mars, the low Reynolds number, high Mach number domain. So, so all these new domains of aerodynamics and you know, configuration and environments will you know, continue to you know, be a you know, uh, demand that we, we, we you know, do, you know, test programs like, like we have been developing in the past. So I've walked you through rotor aerodynamics uh, past and into the future. Again, some of the key aspects I see, see for the future is CFD. We do have to continue advanced treatment of the hard parts, the tr transition, stall. Um, we still have not achieved our goal of 1% performance prediction accuracy with CFD. Uh, dynamic stall, just, you know, still want to have robust empirical models available for us. Uh, Fine state wake models, again, I want to see the definitive model that will cover the entire flow field. Uh, and rotor tests, tilt rotor blades, propellers, planetary rotors. So I think. Uh, there, there, we've, we've made a lot of progress in the, for, since 1974, uh, progress that's been nicely uh, reported in most of these uh, conferences. And I do see that we have lots of work for the aerodynamicists in the future, though. Thank you. Thank you.